Coming up on Digital Music Trends 216, recorded on the 21st of January 2015, Apple buys a Symmetric, UK Business Secretary calls for a unified European digital market, an interview with Deezer on the Move acquisition, Primary Wave merges with Intellectual Artists Management, Physical Sales remains stable in Germany, Ardeus European hires, Sony Sphere UK cancelled, Rock in Rio's Vegas lineup, Placebo's Cobalt deal and TLC's Kickstarter. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Linali and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and if you're listening on a streaming service or watching the video on YouTube, you should also know that the show is available to download for free using any podcast app so you can take it with you and listen to it or watch it wherever you like and this week we have another busy one, January is always a good time for staff moves and uh, company announcements and it's a pleasure to be able to chat about the week's news with Sami Andrews, uh, head of digital at Cooking Vinyl and MD at the consultancy Sabotage New Media. So hi Sami and thanks for joining me once again. How's it going? Very well, thank you. Busy busy with Prodigy and Marilyn Manson at the moment in Cooking Vinyl and <laughs> Annie Lennox independently. Busy start to the year here. It's very exciting and, and actually I'm, I'm super excited about the Marilyn Manson record because I listened to it last night and it's actually really good because I was quite disappointed it's by the, great. It's I was brilliant. disappointed by it was the previous one. Go and get it. Absolutely, I would recommend it and uh, uh, I'm a long time uh, Marilyn Manson fan, so uh, definitely worth uh, uh, re- rediscovering him. And uh, uh, on the other side, we have Duncan uh, Gear, a freelance journalist and environmental Ooh. scientist. And it's always a pleasure to have you on board, Duncan. And uh, how's it, it going? It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, Duncan is one of the funding pillars of DMT, as he was one of my earliest <laughs> guests uh, of the news format. So he's given us some great contributions over the years. And uh, and so today we have a breaking news uh, and an amazing uh, an amazing news uh, for a UK startup uh, in that uh, uh, Apple has acquired a uh, 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 Symmetric, which which is the parent company of Music Metric, uh, as reported by Stuart Dredge at The Guardian. Uh, although Apple has declined to comment on the acquisition, and indeed it sounds like uh, uh, Stuart actually found this out uh, look, by looking at the documents on Company House, really, because... Uh, um, he has got an eagle eye, has he? has got an eagle eye, definitely. Uh, he, you know, we haven't heard much else about this. Uh, uh, from, from, from Music Metric or indeed Apple. Uh, so Apple has declined to comment on the acquisition at this point, but it, it looks like this is something that has been going on for quite some time. Uh, uh, a senior Apple attor- attorney, uh, Jen, uh, Jean Levoff, uh, was appointed as a director of uh, Symmetric in October 2014. So they've been working together for some time. And so this uh, sort of bodes well in terms of uh, uh, potential integration towards the Beats Music uh, uh, relaunch or integration into iTunes. So, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, prices, we don't know anything. We don't know how much it went for uh, we don't know how well the company was doing at the time but regardless of all those factors it still sounds like a pretty good uh, uh, you know a, a pretty positive development for a UK startup with a, with a really decent exit working in the music space and uh, just a quick uh, commentary on this it's you know it's a very fresh news piece but uh, uh, Duncan do you think that this might be something that comes up in the uh, sort of back end but accessible to artists so they can see what's going on with the streaming or would Apple just implement this as, as an in-house thing for their own or are all good. I mean, it's always hard to tell with Apple. Apple yeah. are kind of this big, inscrutable monolith, and you're never really quite sure what they're up to. But um, I don't know. I, I think it would be... I, I don't have any personal experience of kind of the back end of iTunes, but um, from what I understand, it doesn't give you sort of a whole lot to play with. And it would be much, it would be really, really nice if artists did get a little bit more to, to play with, particularly when it comes to streaming. Yeah. Obviously, Spotify has been widely criticized for not telling its artists enough. So if Apple yeah, can do Spotify, something a bit better. Spotify have been trying to, though, with their you know, next big sound integration and a few other things. Spotify have really upped their game on uh, the stuff they're feeding out to artists and labels lately. And it would be really nice for uh, artists and for labels, I think, to be able to get a bit more from platforms. And um, there's a lot to be said for <laughs> being able to look at some lovely data. <laughs> as, long as, as long as it's true. Yeah, as long as it's true. And, and as long yeah. as, you know, as long as... Uh, you know, the, the, one of the things that the, the guys at Music Metric always stressed was the fact that they always try to in, uh, help artists interpret the data uh, to a certain extent. So for them, uh, you know, at least in the last sort of 12 to 18 months, the focus was really uh, uh, more than tracking the data because they had that essentially down. It was, it was more a lot of glitches, though. I'll say yeah, that. I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> there was a lot, of, a lot of glitches, a lot of that in a few of them. It's part of the main challenge, I think, with anyone maintaining a platform like that. If you're feeding that data out on a very large scale and people are relying and or attempting to make decisions on it and it's corrupt, absolutely pointless. It makes it worthless. So it's so important for them to put the time in. And if, if Apple are buying um, them out and then 
perfect chance to have an overview and see that if everything is working as it should be. Yeah, um, actually, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I remember that I, I used the platform maybe three years ago. So we're talking about a while ago. It's, it's not a testament to how it's working now, but but yeah, th there was a lot of information missing still and, and a lot of data that was sort of. Uh, uh, There's a lot of things to take into account. I mean, there's a few companies I know working on brilliant uh, platforms doing the same stuff, but it, depending when people get data loads and live feeds from the likes of uh, iTunes and Spotify and social networks, there's, there's so many factors um, in getting those streams in and then presenting yeah. them in a way, but it's, it's definitely one of the main pitfalls, I think, of all of those platforms is making sure that it's true data and that they're representing the actual picture <laughs> and not a picture from two days ago that might have changed and yeah yeah yeah, yeah, but yeah good turn nonetheless nice to see a uk company yeah absolutely and, and it's kind of interesting because like uh, in a way duncan it's it's weird that apple has always been so uh, open you know s not weird but it's it's normal because it's like not technology company but they, they've always been extremely uh, accommodating uh, as far as you know content providers that are app developers are concerned and you know providing them lots of different tools and, and different things uh, on, on, on the on the back end but uh, as you mentioned music was uh, always a bit of a dark art trying to figure out who is buying what where when uh, iTunes Connect uh, wasn't a fantastic tool I've used it a few times uh, and uh, it, it didn't give you that much data so do you think that this might also signal a shift for Apple in becoming a bit more artist and content creator friendly? I mean, over the kind of last couple of years, Apple has definitely been moving in a much more uh, friendly, open direction. Right. Um, ever since uh, Tim Cook sort of took the reins, they've been moving in a, a direction that's a lot more, a lot friendlier and and more accessible. And I think yeah. this is just a co continuation of that trend, really. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, um, obviously, we'll hear more about this in the coming days. I didn't even try to reach out to Music Matter because I know what it's like when you get bought by Apple. I've, so they're getting a few phone calls. I heard, today. Of, a, yeah. I heard of a few companies. Uh, I know of a few companies that were bought by Apple and, and they could never talk about it, at least not immediately afterwards. So I kind of uh, didn't even try. Uh, maybe I should have. But uh, yeah, uh, I will hopefully we'll hear from them in the next few weeks and they'll be able to, to uh, say a little bit more about what's going on there. And uh, uh, sticking with the UK news, actually, there's an interesting thing happening yesterday uh, where uh, Vince Cable, who's the UK's uh, business secretary, uh, in a speech given whilst in Brussels, called for a single online market for Europe when it comes to services like Spotify and Netflix. So he said, I'm calling but for the pretty creation. Pretty big announcement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty big announcement. I, I haven't seen it. I think he's talking in Brussels today. Is yeah, it? actually, yeah. It was yesterday that the reports came out about what he was going to say. And then uh, I think he's actually already done the speech. I've just uh, pulled up the, the headline in the last uh, sort of hour or so. And he's just finished uh, the speech, uh, I believe. And so he said, I'm calling for the creation of a single digital, uh, the digital single market. Not uh, only would this boost the UK and Eurozone economy by 340 billion euros, but it would uh, make uh, online prices fairer, enable startups to be formed within 24 hours hours and help businesses sell throughout the EU. So Cable actually didn't divulge any uh, divulge any details as to uh, how these changes would be would be brought about. Uh, there is a lot of challenges ahead uh, as far as uh, the the movie industry is concerned, particularly uh, given that uh, every single movie has got a different essentially the distribution uh, house. In, in and it's bit under independent courses. labels as well. I mean, I, there's, there's so yeah. much to be considered here with licenses, and I mean, the, the, on you know, on the grand scheme, could, you know, could be an amazing thing. I mean, if, from a consumer point of view, I completely get it i mean it annoys me if you travel and you can't you can't access something in a different country yeah but for the entertainment industry and i'm you know and as far wide as the apps and anything else that this is going to cover um I did, there's a lot to go through here and i think it's <laughs> i'd like to see exactly what he said and any plans that he has in place to want to launch this up but just the copyright and Oh God, everything pricing. That there's so much to to take into account here. Yeah, I just think it was a very bold statement. I'd, I'd not read anything about it until this morning, and um, I think we'll all be watching this quite a lot over the coming week. Yeah, absolutely, and, and it's kind of a it's interesting also to see something like this announced uh, just before a general election as well. Uh, and it's so unusual, the big announcements before the end of yeah, it. It is unusual because like, it's not the kind of thing that would drive votes. So you wonder why this happened. Well, is it though? You can get Netflix if you go, if you want to go over to Spain and watch, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> did this something that sort of, uh, when the thing I did read earlier, this, you know, including things like iPlayer and stuff. I mean, even for that, the BBC currently sell out their content from here. Right. And, this, there's just so much to consider. Yeah. I, I just, I'd, I'd love to see how, it, how it's going to affect our industry and price points in certain countries and tax. You know, it's a can of worms, and I'm, I'm looking forward to finding out about it. But 
<laughs> so, but you just you know release dates and the, obviously we, we place content at different times for different reasons and for promo things for practical reasons for artists promo routes yeah. there's uh, so much to be considered so i kind of am intrigued to see where it's going duncan <laughs> I mean, you're absolutely right. The devil's in the details here. But mm. the thing is that I, you've, you've made it very clear how difficult this is, and it is an incredibly difficult thing to do. But if you can do it, then that is a massive blow in the fight against piracy. One of the massive reasons why people still pirate stuff is because they can't get something where they yes. live that they yeah. want to get. So if you can get that thing, and you know, most people are, are perfectly willing to pay for stuff if you make it available to them. Right now, there's a lot of stuff that isn't available. And I totally if agree. Can, if he can fix it, then that will destroy, a, you know, another pillar that the piracy, piracy community is standing on. Yeah, I think, I think there's something that, there's something that interested me over Christmas for all of the farce about the interview film, um, the most hyped film of, of some time. <laughs> One thing that the release of that did show is, is that the global release of a film digitally, I'm pretty sure that's the first time that that has been done on that scale. And it was tremendously successful. In, it wasn't the, actually global, though, because I, I couldn't get hold of it <laughs> with, in the UK. So uh, I, I was I, in North Korea and I just couldn't find it at all. <laughs> 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 I've got it quite quick, but there's a lot to be said for the global release date. So we're, we're very careful in, in our industry about the, the mixed messaging we give. It's really confusing for fan bases when we put stuff out on different dates. And there's been several calls maybe to get an aligned release date globally, um, yes. and it would help. So you know things like Facebook and Twitter. It's nearly impossible, even with geo targeting, to communicate an album release and why they have to wait 24 hours or sometimes three days to get it somewhere else. Yeah. So like, if, if it can work, and that's my thinking on this as well if it can work and we're all happy with it and it works for everyone brilliant but um I, there's a lot of things that they're going to have to iron out and i'd really like to see the roadmap for how they intend to do it yeah and I mean, uh, first of all we need like uh, we need the grd but the grd is not happening so yeah that's the first problem right yeah that is going to be a, <laughs> an issue <laughs> and, uh, and and yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, as you said, you know, the release date coordination is, is, is still difficult. I mean, uh, it's also influenced by leaks all the time. We've seen Bjork uh, today yeah. uh, had to rush release her record after it leaked online, which In is a, a couple of those. Yeah, which is a massive blow, I guess, to her campaign. Well, you, I tell, tell, for, for that, I mean, going back to what I said about the issues with having licensees, I mean, obviously, as an independent network, beyond any major release, we have partners in place all over the world, and I know Bjork's label, One Little Indian, will do as well. There'll be different licensees in place everywhere. To suddenly have to release something so quickly can really have an impact on, on the rest of those deals that you've got in place. And a bit aside from any promotional plans, uh, I'm not sure if they, they will manage to maintain all the release plans that they have globally possibly not yeah and it's a, i think it's a, a real shame when artists are forced and you know we all face it now and again when something leaks and our hands forced to do something as a reaction where you know the label and the artist would much rather put it out as intended with you know all, all the care and appreciation that went into it so i think it's a shame actually if, if it's a genuine foot hand force to get it out there that quick yeah yeah uh, and it's it's yeah it's a real shame because you you know also like a, a bjork record is not a cheap record to make so no, uh, no. <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's a shame when that that kind of thing happens uh duncan the, we've read so so many pieces around uh artists sort of locking their process down and there was a lot written also about madonna's creative process uh uh and her team's creative process really uh, around the record and how locked down that is and and how difficult it was for this to leak really uh linked to the uh, to the to the various hacks that have happened over the last few months do you think it's inevitable or do you think there are ways that artists can lock themselves down i mean of course there's ways to lock it down if you absolutely want to just put everything onto a cassette and, you know, <laughs> and then nobody's i get really like that idea I'm a like two-inch <laughs> tape go, let's go back to the two-inch tapes <laughs> but um yeah you know i mean there are a lot of artists out there who have a very collaborative um process when they're creating a record who want to share the kind of in progress stuff as much as possible there's you know different ways you can approach it if yeah. you want to lock it down sure that's your choice if you don't i think there are also benefits to be had on that side yeah you make a really good point there you know a lot more artists especially with pledge and other other types of approaches you see them share more and more of the record before it comes out uh which makes leaks it kind of defeats leaks in a sense because it means that fans already sort of have an idea of what's going on there uh, yeah. and uh, uh yes yeah, so i wanted to move on to talk a little bit about oh actually and that story actually links out to uh, the fact that uh, uh, there was a report around the uk creative industries and uh, apparently they're worth uh, 71 uh, billion 
uh, pounds a year, uh, which is quite uh, an astounding amount of money. Uh, and uh, uh, it wasn't broken down by sectors, but uh, uh, you know the, the number alone sort of shows why Vince, uh, somebody like Vince Cable would uh, put uh, that kind of stress on the on, on the delivery of, of content because it, it is a very viable industry for the UK. And hopefully, that will also influence government policy when it comes to protecting uh, that industry and sort of helping it grow. And the next on the show, we're going to have an interview with Beth Murphy from uh, Deezer uh, US. And we're going to talk about the acquisition of Move Music and see how that fits into Deezer's strategy. It's a real pleasure to welcome to the show uh, once again Beth Murphy, the CMO at Deezer North America. So hi, Beth, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Hi, good. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. And so uh, today we're going to talk a little bit more about what's uh, been going on in the last few weeks. Uh, and uh, obviously I had you on uh, back when you announced the Deezer Elite uh, uh, program back in September. And uh, today you're back uh, to chat to us about what's going on with the, the Move acquisition. So uh, first of all, can you explain a little bit uh, what that entails uh, to our listeners? Um, sure. So uh, Deezer purchased Move from AT&T's Cricket. Cricket has 3,000 stores nationwide. Um, so it will be available to Move users as a replacement uh, for their music service. So they'll be able to import their Move music libraries into Deezer. Yeah. Um, they, they'll be able to try the service for four months, up to four months, depending on their billing cycle, uh, for free. Yeah. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, we'll be sort of partnering with Cricket in all their stores and will be loaded on all Cricket phones as well. So new users will be able to discover uh, Deezer as well. Um, all that will be priced at $6. Yeah, which a is month. an amazing point, right? It's, it's an amazing yeah. price, price point. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a, a premium um, service. It's, it's a pretty unprecedented price. Um, so we're offering the Cricket user a great uh, price uh, for a premium streaming service. Yeah, that's great. And, and so essentially, you know, what's what we're seeing here is a dual tactic, right? So on, on the on the upper end, you have the twenty dollar a month, the nineteen ninety nine dollar a month. Uh, these are elite for those that want the high quality. And then uh, on, on the lower end, you have this uh, amazing integration with the Cricket, which uh, provides it with a pool of uh, of a uh, you know somewhere around a couple of million users so that were using Move Music that might be able to uh, migrate uh, into these. So obviously, uh, the interesting point here is that I actually I criticized the Forbes piece that was saying that uh, you know you guys would automatically become a second service uh, uh, in streaming in the US because actually those users don't migrate automatically they have to opt in right so yeah the users uh, have to migrate um, yeah. we also technically purchased an acquired move in their customers so you could say that we Deezer now owns those customers but right. yes you're correct in order to get them on Deezer they do need to um, uh, start using the service. Yep. Um, we're doing everything uh, to make that as attractive as possible. So they'll be able to log in with their phone number. They'll be able to um, get their library and they'll be able to try the service for four months. So we think we've made it so compelling that it will be um, really easy for those customers to try Deezer. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, when, when I heard of the news, it kind of felt like uh, uh, it made total sense uh, because you know when, when you think about a new entrant in the North American market and you think how the hell are they going to get some customers you know it's, it's, it's so many services go going on uh, there and so uh, was this sort of like a primary uh, a part of your of your uh, launch in the US or did you consider other things I know you probably can't talk about what they were but did you have a few other options in mind when, when you were uh, thinking about how to launch in the US? Well, I think our, our overall approach to the U.S. is similar to what our global approach is, which is looking at different segments of the audience and then super serving them with differentiated products. Yes, yeah. because we believe that it's still a really nascent category. There's only 40 million paid subscribers in streaming. There's still 2 billion people listening to music. So there's this huge opportunity for, from a product perspective, to create uh, new experiences for users and bring them in the, into the category. So you've sort of seen that with Deezer Elite. We're super serving audiophiles with high resolution audio and with um, the cricket news we're really looking at that prepaid retail segment and we're looking at ways that we can super serve um, customers that are normally not uh, served by the music uh, streaming services or targeted so um, you know we're really uh, focusing on that audience and looking at ways that we can continue to meet that audience segment needs as well yeah sure and so for now uh, uh, is it is it, it was going to be possible for non-cricket users to sign up to uh, uh, Deezer yet or is that going to be further down the line 
that will be further down the line. Um, so, so you, yeah, you've seen sort of a steady drumbeat of news from uh, the Deezer team as we as we uh, make it more available in the U.S. market. Um, yeah. So, stay tuned for for more news and more moves that you'll see that sort of demonstrate that we're really uh, trying to grow the audience in in the U.S. market. That's perfect. Uh, and thank you so much, Beth, for that update. Uh, very exciting news from Deezer. And uh, uh, go and check out the links in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Okay, great. Thank you for having me. And uh, let's talk about management because uh, um, we heard uh, of another uh, big management company, Primary Wave. Uh, uh, it's uh, essentially merged uh, with uh, another uh, full service talent and literally management, media and content production company called uh, Intellectual Artist Management. So this union uh, reports Billboard creates a full service entertainment management company with talent spanning creative industries from music to film to television and literary and will operate under, un under a new uh, name, Primary Wave Entertainment. Uh, so uh, uh, they will include uh, Grammy Award winners like CeeLo Green, uh, Melissa Erdridge, uh, Cypress Hill, uh, Golden Globe winner Gina Rodriguez, uh, Oscar winner Bobby Moresco. So a whole host of actors, uh, musicians, uh, uh, you know, uh, writers. And, and also it will include a lot of other elements, you know, in terms of uh, management that go beyond what, what management would usually do. So uh, just a quick comment on that would be, have we, are we seeing no, a they're shift? They're not the first. And when, no, that's kind of where this is slightly misleading. Yeah. I mean, I, I started of life in London working at 19 Simon Fuller's company yeah. now, now XIX who have been doing exactly that I mean for years that's one of their most successful business models is managing acts for music sponsorship books the, the whole shebang for any right you can imagine but I think the, the shift that you're talking about is it's not a new concept at all but right. ne not necessarily a widely adopted concept um, by management companies but um, it's part and parcel now I mean we, we all know that there's a for artists especially, sponsorship can make far more money on some occasions than their record sales that they're getting. Yeah. And it's it's a whole separate income. And I think it would make sense that if a management company has the capacity and are good enough to, total sense for them to look over that artist's entire career because it all links together now. Yeah. And, whenever, and there is, a, is branding to some degree. You know, they're putting themselves out there in whatever capacity. So I think it makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure we're going to see more of it. But it's, it's definitely not a new concept per yeah. se. I was just wondering, you know, do you think that you know, obviously, as you pointed out, this is not a new thing. I was just wondering if you think that management companies might be taking on more and more activities that perhaps in the past were delegated to third parties. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I've seen, I think seen a lot of management companies deliberately being really good people uh, in-house um, for that reason. They're setting up little, you know, almost their own little agency now. And they can't, yeah. I think they have to do that if they want to uh, be able to look after artists' every need in, in that business space. Um, they do, you know, they they need to. So I think we'll still see a lot of traditional management. And, you know, I love some of the old boy managers that we, you know, get in. It was just outright rock and roll stuff. But right. there's a lot to be said for, for getting involved in the rest of that world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Duncan, do you have any any, any uh, experience or thoughts around what's happening in, in, in your area, sort of in, in the Nordic uh, countries when it comes to bands and management and, and how, how the, that whole uh, uh, ecosystem is shaping up? I mean, to be honest, I don't sort of work very closely with uh, sort of bands and managers and on the industry side of things here. I'm more more of a fan than anything else. But um, I know that the Nordics definitely kind of look towards the UK as a, as a model for how to do things generally. And yeah. so I think sort of stuff like this will definitely be having an influence over here. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, with all the different uh, popular music academies and schools over there, I'm sure that they'll be watching what's happening at Primary Wave pretty closely. Absolutely. Mm. And, and uh, the other interesting figure that we got this week was the fact that preliminary uh, numbers from the uh, Bundesministers für Werke und Digitale Infrastruktur uh, ish, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> the BNVI show that the German recorded music industry is in root health and it, it's surpassing the UK's in revenues by over 100 million euros, turning over 1.48 8 billion euros in total so uh, Germany a huge music market still what's astounding is that 75% of recorded music revenues still come from physical. CD and vinyl yeah they love their physical there like, they're, that's a very, incredible. they're a very very interesting case but I mean on a wider thing I've looked into this a few times for other things but they um on a wider scheme the the actual economy in in germany there's a lot of people do tend not to go the digital route it's not just our industry specifically yeah as, as a country that, that they haven't adapted in exactly the same way as the rest of the world and it's fascinating i think when we can look at it as a, a specific case study for either a, di a different adaption to digital or um 
the way they have gone about it. But the digital is on the increase, though. I mean, it's, uh, that's the one thing yeah. I will say is that that shouldn't be discounted. Yeah. Um, obviously, physical selling really well, and I bet everyone's really happy, so, you know, with the the finances coming in from that. But digital is on the increase, and there's uh, the, the policies in place, you know, with, like gamer and stuff. It's a very different setup out there, and I'm yeah. really glad for them that it's working. But I'm also quite happy to see that digital is growing, so they're not being completely stunted. Because I have no doubt whatsoever that digital is the future. I mean, uh, uh, not the now. <laughs> So I'd be slightly concerned if Germany wasn't growing on yeah. digital, but they are. They're adopting to, uh, streaming and digital sales. So it's kind of win-win for them at the moment, I think. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like a, the, the, the physical market has uh, declined by less than 1% and the digital market has risen by 12%. Oh, uh, so yeah. overall, uh, the, the whole music market increased by 1.8%. Uh, percent, and uh, it's just like a really strange uh, phenomenon, really, because uh, uh, I fully expected that there to be a steep decline at some point or another in, in German... Still physical. might listen, let's not hold our breaths. I mean, you know, it's, it's, but, there's... Uh, We've seen steep falls before, yeah. and I think at the moment it's been steady there for them for physical for a while. Um, and I'm sure you know there's more reasoning to it, but th yeah, digital is still definitely on the up. Then I think we'll see that coming into its own a little bit more over the next few years. Yeah, and Duncan, uh, when I talk to uh, some of the, especially the smaller distributors uh, or uh, people that are distributing independent records in Germany, they uh, all still uh, regard a lot of them still regard digital as a bit of an experiment. Is there a bit of a risk uh, that uh, because there's such a reliance on physical records, uh, perhaps they won't uh, develop digital as much as they, they, they should? And uh, I don't know. Well, I mean, as Sammy says, this is inevitable. It's a, a kind of slippery slope. And once you start sliding down it, then yeah, it, it happens. On the bright side, all the other for them anyway all the other countries have been down that slope first to yep. stretch the metaphor the, somewhat the and have hit That's stuff along the way yep. they're going to have a kind of much clearer route down you know down the digital yep. slide yeah it's kind of a smart move it's sounding increasingly ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and no, absolutely it's, it's, it seems like it's uh, uh it's inevitable but you know really uh, amazing to see this because even in Japan, you know, we started to see a, a big decline in physical sales. Yeah, so. I mean, there's something to be said for being a last mover, but at the same time, you know, you then don't get, you know, the opportunity to to innovate in, yeah. in different ways. Yeah. You can't kind of shape the market how you your, your, how you see it best. It's much harder to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and we have a couple of news around uh, uh, RDO. So uh, we reported, uh, I'm not sure if we talked about, uh, about it on the show last week, but uh, uh, Audio, uh, my memory is getting shorter and shorter by the minute. Uh, so Audio has uh, uh, officially launched its music streaming service in, in India uh, following the acquisition in March 2014 of local music streaming service Dingana. Uh, on top of that, the company has actually relaunched essentially its operations in Europe. Uh, they've appointed three new executives uh, to uh, their European operations. Uh, so we got uh, uh, Hong Nyungen. Uh, Nguyen, uh, sorry, uh, he, who will join as head of EMEA. Uh, who, he was previously, previously uh, general manager at Vivo UK. Uh, uh, then we have Alex uh, Vlasopoulos, uh, who will join as vice president of, and head of business, business development at EMEA, uh, joining from Omniphone. And uh, Luke Anthony is going to be joining as director of legal and business affairs. So uh, three appointments in Europe uh, for, for a company that really n never placed that much uh, uh, stress on Europe as a market, just because it, it didn't feel like they were that present really here, at least, at least here in the UK. I never seen. They've been, they've been battling competition for them. I mean, you know, they're, 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 it's quite some bold, again, bold statement moves. The hires that they're doing. Yeah. And um, the the India stuff makes so much sense. I mean, absolutely so much sense. The the market there with smartphones and tablet use is, is going through the roof. Um, and we're seeing a few markets over the last few years sort of convert um, to start buying music and to start. Uh, we have to be in those places for it to get out in the first place and i think rdo have, have done some smart deals already so outside of europe for the yeah. indie stuff they're going to roll out absolutely um, and you know if, a bit of competition is brilliant i mean our, our, my big thing is as long as everyone's getting paid okay and we're we have good relationships with all the streaming sites but um, as long as everyone's getting paid okay i'd like to see some competition there yeah um, and yeah, I'm sort of interested to see how they're going to do. Yeah, I'm excited about seeing Audio sort of uh, uh, renew their efforts in Europe uh, because you know we do need uh, some more players in in, in the market. And uh, uh, I don't know, Duncan, do you feel like uh, uh, Audio has a chance in in the UK, for example, given that uh, Spotify has such a dominance of the market and uh, and YouTube as well? You know, it, it is a tough market here in the UK. Yeah, they haven't got a chance. 
<laughs> you know, I'll, I'll be brutally honest there. They really right. absolutely don't have a chance. Their chance is in these emerging markets like India. Yes. But I mean, India is kind of tricky because their music industry, their pop music industry anyway, is so in inexorably tied in with Bollywood and, yeah. and that yeah. whole industry. And so, uh, you know, trying to do a kind of music streaming thing on its own without the support of the, the video side of things, it's, it's a very kind of different proposition. And yeah. from a country that historically hasn't had that much of a independent music industry on its own it's 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 going to be tough but yeah i mean they've good luck to them. Is good. No, they've done a few strategic partnerships out there as well i mean there's been a lot lately and it's definitely the future in some territories with the tie-ins with in-car streaming and yeah. um, they've gone into bed with volvo over there um but the, the initiatives like that and Spotify have seen huge increases by doing the tie-ins with mobile operators. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And if they're smart with it, there are ways that they can infiltrate some of those markets, yeah, I think. Absolutely. And, you know, and so like I said, good luck to them. I think, I think yes. it's possible, but yeah, the, the odds are against tough. them. Yeah. yeah, I think also in Europe, I mean, there's a, you're talking about emerging territories, but also territories where digital is just developing, there is a bigger chance of developing. Like Germany. Uh, <laughs> like Germany, like <laughs> Italy, you know, Spotify is present in Italy, they're, they're, they're getting stronger, but they're definitely not dominant yet. Uh, uh, you know, in France, who knows what's, what's going to happen with Deezer, you know, if it's going to stay at the level it's at, or if there is a, a, a way of grabbing a bit of, of Deezer's market shares, people start uh, looking around. Uh, so yeah, but we're going to see what happens, but uh, exciting to see Ardio sort of, because they didn't have much, much of a base, I don't think, here in Europe anyway. Uh, so yeah, it's exciting to see them sort of make a move and, and, see, and see what happens there. Uh, a bit of festival news, as the Sonisphere unfortunately was cancelled, uh, a very, very good uh, rock, uh, sort of, a good old rock festival. Uh, in, Brilliant festival. In the UK. Okay, had a good dance there last year. <laughs> that was cancelled uh, by the promoter, UK promoter Kilimanjaro Live. Uh, lots of bands are uh, set to play, like the Prodigy, Prodigy, Metallica, Iron Maiden, Black Sabbath, and the S Slipknot. Uh, you know, I, not much to say about that. It's, it's unfortunate. Uh, uh, I, it's I'm sad, not... but, you know, but I'm glad if, if they took the decision. I mean, yeah. and obviously this is not the first time that Sonisphere have done that. And something I really respect about all the guys over at Kilimanjaro, instead of leaving it far too late and pissing off a load of people that have bought tickets and annoying a load of bands and changing band schedule, they've sat down, they've weighed this up, they've had a conversation, and it's really sad. I would love to see that festival there. I think it's a brilliant festival. But um, it's a smart move to have done it this early, I think. Just make the call now and they can go and concentrate on some other efforts for the year. Yeah, yeah. So and uh, and moving on from a festival that, that is not uh, uh, is not going to happen this year, in, at least in the UK, to a festival that is happening. Uh, Rock in Rio has announced uh, the first lineup of its uh, first ever festival in the United States that will play, take place in Las Vegas in May. So it, the event will be spread over two weekends: May the eighth and May the ninth, and then May fifteenth and May the sixteenth. And it will actually cater to two different audiences, which is quite an interesting experiment. They will have a, a rock weekend, uh, which is will have Metallica, uh, no doubt, as headliners, together with. Uh, yeah. Are there any festivals that don't have Metallica on these, <laughs> exactly. these days? <laughs> exactly. And and then, uh, you know, Deftones will join Linkin Park. Uh, and then also like a random people like Foster the People, which doesn't make, I don't know, it doesn't make sense. Uh, and then uh, the second weekend will be all about pop music with uh, uh, Taylor Swift headlining with Bruno Mars, uh, Sam Smith, uh, uh, Charlie XCX, uh, uh, John Legend and Jesse J. So a massive pop weekend as well. Duncan, uh, uh, how, do you, how do you feel about uh, this kind of weird mix of pop uh, pop and rock and uh, uh, I don't know do, do you think that uh, uh, how, how do you feel about this whole Las Vegas uh, sort of strip uh, festival experience I would love to go this sounds awesome <laughs> sounds terrifying <laughs> I mean you know festivals have mixed pop and rock music for years I mean Glastonbury has been doing it since day one basically yeah so I don't think that's uh, especially notable I think it's kind of almost more notable that they're segmenting the two yeah. and, and keeping them apart and that seems like a slightly weird thing to do but yeah I'm sure it'll probably work for them. Um, in terms of Vegas, I, I've been to Vegas once for the Consumer Electronics Show, and it's a terrifying place. Isn't I, it? That's, that's it's a scary just, part it's so for me. Weird. Like the, yeah, Vegas? Right. That's dangerous. I mean, is, is this a camping thing, or is it a, how is it going to work? I have no it idea. Maybe. A bit it's, warm, maybe. Yeah, I was going to say, it's going to be a bit warm, and depending on which month it's in. If it's in it's the winter, only, then it'll be really cold. But, well, it's in May, yeah. so it should be quite warm at that point. Uh, and it's also 80, 000, only 80,000 people, so I'm sure the hotels in Vegas can easily cater for 80,000 people. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, I mean, if I, I was mean, staying in Vegas, yeah, it'll I would be interesting camp. to see how it does. I don't like to camp anyway, so if I was staying in Vegas, I would definitely not camp. That's not, not my <laughs> thing. I'm not an open-air kind of person, so uh, <laughs> definitely feel safer indoors. Oh, you're <laughs> missing out. 
out. The open air is wonderful. Yeah, it's good fun. <laughs> I, I like it during the day. A bit of can... glamping, Andrea. That's what you need. Ooh, oh, no, no. <laughs> Take a duvet, a pillow. It'd be lovely. <laughs> yeah, a pillow, a pillow, a pillow is fine. No, I've done it. I've done it at South by, and, and uh, you know that was that was quite enough for me. Uh, and. So yeah, interesting stuff. Uh, you know, they're, they're building a whole new venue uh, with the Cirque du Soleil and MGM resorts. So we shall see what happens with Rock and Rio in Vegas. And finally, uh, no, finally, we got a couple more stories to talk about. Uh, we have. Uh, British alternative rock band Placebo has signed a deal with Cobalt Label Services for a global distribution uh, a deal of its entire back catalogue. So this is quite interesting because it involves six studio albums and that's not that usual really. We don't we don't get that many bands that get their entire catalogue back and can actually uh, market them the best way they want to. Uh, so the sign represents quite a big coup for Cobalt Label Services and uh, uh, obviously the company aims to leverage its global digital marketing expertise and their back-end platform services that they developed with a massive investment really. The, the, the this figure was that they invested 55 million dollars in their back-end platform to track all the royalties and make make sure that it's uh, very transparent for musicians so this is a big uh, deal but also interesting to see whether we're going to see more bands that uh, are able to take their back catalog and actually uh, decide their future with their back catalog i mean i know a lot of deals are quite restrictive around that but uh, sammy how, how do you feel about that do you think we're going to see more more uh, bands be able to do this in the future okay. I, I think I'd like to see more bands be able to do it. I mean, you know, especially the, the artist service deals and the label service deals, which we do them here, Cobalt do them as well. There's a lot of people doing it at the moment. And artists have only just realised, I think, over the last few years that they are suddenly in control. And it's quite uh, a liberating thing, sat down talking to the larger artists, who, you know, who had huge albums 10, 20 years ago, who don't understand quite how much control they, they're capable of having now. And it's a bit of a game changer for back catalogue, especially if we look at the way that streaming services are now working. Yeah. Um, it's past the original point of sale. So the record label, hopefully, you know, back in the day, Recoup made their money, sure they did, there was lion shares going on then. But now, if you can gain your back catalogue back, as long as you set up on the streaming sites, you're going to earn every time someone listens to that for the rest of your life, as long as it's a good record. Like if people keep, you know, make crap records, not so much. Yeah. But there's this major power to, to be had there. And I think a lot of the the majors are, won't want to let go of anything. Yeah. And I, sadly, a lot of artists were, you know, signed their lives away pretty much. I mean, there's a, some contracts are questionable, I still think, to this day for the, from the majors from years ago. But um, anyone that can get access to their rights, absolutely they should. And I'm sure there's some that revert over time if artists did good deals at the time. But there's never been a better time for an artist to have complete control over their career, including their back catalogue, yeah. and be able to leverage that to, to, to make money in the future. And it's a brilliant thing. And um, I'm glad Placebo went that route. Yeah. Uh, and Duncan, do you think that there might be a bit, a bit threatening to major labels that are seeing some of their big albums go? And, you know, that, uh, as Sammy said, the strength really relies on, on the fact that they have this huge catalogue that they can go to services with and actually bargain their position uh, with that catalogue. I mean, I think most of the major labels are going to look at it and say, you know, placebo, does anyone under the age of 25 actually know who they are or listen to them ever? Right. Like they, they're much, much more focused on the kind of youth audience right now, I think, and, uh, yeah. and chasing after that. So I don't think they're going to be particularly bothered about placebo. If it were Taylor Swift, that would be another matter entirely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Agreed. But I, I, I've got some doubts that she'll be able to, to take her catalog with her. Uh, with, I mean, even if she's independent, but her label might have some questions around that. Uh, and the uh, final news for today is that the two remaining members of TLC uh, have launched a Kickstarter campaign with a $150,000 uh, goal to fund the recording of a group's final album. So interesting, you know, a, a pretty major uh, group back uh, in the in the 90s. Uh, they are uh, looking to uh, create an album uh, the, the goals are a little bit sketchy in the sense that they're, you know, they're they're looking to raise 150 grand just for the writing sessions with the producer and engineer. So it sounds like a lot of money, and then you know anything beyond that will do will go towards recording. It is, isn't there? Only three of them. No, it's two of them. <laughs> it's two of them. It's two. Yeah, because yeah, because uh, the the last one, unfortunately. So uh, and uh, yeah, so interesting budgeting there, but. Uh, also good to see a big artist like that sort of come in and tr and, and try the crowdfunding route because we haven't seen that much of it yet. I think people are still uh, a little yeah, bit... Yeah, we saw Slash had a, a pledge. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we, a lot of artists that we work with work closely with pledge. I mean, there have been some really successful cases, but I mean, an artist at that level, sort of global pop, I agree. I mean, that's sort of unusual, but absolutely, why not? I mean, I, I don't necessarily... Uh, I wonder whether they chose to do that route yeah. or whether what they wanted to achieve wasn't available through them 
to, to, through the other routes. But of course, it's open to everyone, and crowdfunding has changed a whole load of games. I mean, not just ours, but it's it's never again given the artists more power than they've ever had before. If they have an active fan base there, they can leverage that and get money up front to make an album. It's I fully fully support that, and I, if they want to do it, brilliant. Yeah. A lot of money for a writing session, though. I will it say. is. It is a lot of money, and uh, yeah, it's interesting to see. You know, we saw, for example, Amanda Palmer uh, uh, try to to uh, push Morrissey into doing a crowdfunding. You know, you, it'd be interesting to see an artist of that size uh, and that kind have of huge fan base yeah, have a go at, at doing a Kickstarter or a pledge. Uh, Duncan, do you think 2015 we might see more uh, big artists uh, uh, go into this? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes is the answer to your question. I think we probably will. I think, uh, I mean, like Sammy says, this is a, a really great time to be an artist and especially an artist with a fan base because you can yeah. do whatever you want if you've got the fan base. Yeah. Um, again, I sort of get asked the same question I did about Placebo. You know, do, do that many young people today still know who TLC are? I mean, <laughs> well, Waterfalls. It, it, oh, come on. Yeah, I mean, Waterfalls, sure. But, you <laughs> That's know, the only anyone, one I could name though, yeah. but it is well, a tune. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of questioning as to whether this Kickstarter will even succeed, hit, hit its target. I mean, I'd, I'd like it if it did, but we'll see. As well. Well, I think that uh, uh, yesterday they hit like a third of it in a day. So. Are they uh, going to put a cover of waterfalls on it? Mm-hmm. Waterfalls on it. <laughs> well, there are there are two thirds in already, two days in. So the that's that's what... Let's see if it works. Or I think it's it's a platform that's there for everyone. So I mean, I had it... looked at the page. I didn't know they were that far forward. So in that case, yeah, I'm sure they probably will do it if they've done two thirds in two days. But... So if it goes if it goes that way, they might actually raise a million bucks. Who knows? Uh... <laughs> will you be pledging, Andre? No, <sighs> no. I, I I like two songs. That's it. Uh, and. Uh... <laughs> And and so uh, for the final bit for my uh, DMT listeners uh, that are quite on on the uh, music production and geeky front, uh, there is an exciting story about Moog, uh, 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 Moog or Moog, Moog, uh, Moog, Moog, Moog. Moog. Yes. Moog, right. So uh, Moog Music is releasing a limited run of newly manufactured version of its early modular units from the early 1970s uh, and, and mid-1970s, really. Uh, System 55, System 35 and Model 15. Each synth will be handmade according to the 1970 original schematics. And uh, this is The Verge uh, uh, reporting this. And uh, uh, the synthesizers will cost between 50, uh, 35 grand and 10 grand, so definitely not cheap. Uh, but you'll be able to get uh, a hold of essentially the same machine, but new, which is very, very exciting. And accompanying the release is an 18-minute documentary about the history of Moog's uh, m- modular synths, uh, which features various performances and uh, is, I'm sure, very, very exciting. So if you are a fan of synths, uh, this is definitely one to check out. And I've, it's had a lot of action on Twitter as well. Uh, so, I can add something to this. Yeah, sure. Um, if you're a fan of synths and don't have 50 grand or whatever it was to pay for, there's a Swedish company called Teenage Engineering who make lovely, beautiful synthesizers. And they mm-hmm. have just announced a, a little line of synthesizers that they're going to sell along with t-shirts like bundled with t-shirts and they cost like $59 each so wow. that's a, an, an alternative option for you they're, they're very nice that sounds awesome I was just, I just <laughs> I'm just on their site now this says, it says something about this is quick that's quick <laughs> it says Get something about right. journalism in action right oh yeah here. oh yeah <laughs> it says that they're going to be a NAM uh later this month so if anybody's at NAM, go and check out Teenage Engineering and they'll have, they'll have very cool company there. and uh, that's all I think for this week uh, um, thank you so much for joining me on the show uh, Sammy once again uh, if you want to push a- or plug any release that you have at the moment uh, feel free oh God, where do I start <laughs> uh, Prodigy I mean if you have if no one's checked out the new Prodigy track yet go and check it out I mean the head of Radio 1 music's been raving about it we even had Darkus over at Island raving about it on Twitter nice. it's always nice to see some people shouting um, and Marilyn Manson new album Storn Away new album we've got loads going on over here at the moment very exciting and so thank you so much for your time I'm sure you're uh, crazy busy you're uh, over there and Duncan anything you're on that you want to point us to or any piece that's coming out uh, not especially, not off the top of my head. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and catch everything that I post there. If I've got anything exciting, I will definitely tell everyone about it on, on Twitter, at Duncan Gear. Yeah, perfect. Uh, both of my guests today are very sensible and have their actual uh, uh, first name and surname as their Twitter <laughs> handle, which is the easiest way to go, really. Uh, and so thank you so much for joining me today, and thank you so much for listening to Digital Music Trends. The show, show, show comes out every week, and you can find it on digitalmusictrends.com. Thank you so much for listening. Have a fantastic week, and until next time. 